Hello, and welcome to today's podcast. I'm Susan Guthrie, your host, and I'm oh so excited because we have one of our most popular guests back with us today. Tracy Malone is back with us, everyone. You remember Tracy. She is the author of Divorcing Your Narcissist. You can't make this shit up. And I don't know if we're going to have to beat that out or not, Tracy. Do you... <laughs> uh, she's also the founder of NarcissistAbuseSupport.com, a narcissist abuse recovery specialist and coach. And she is a Sir Thriver. That is her term. You see it behind her for those of you that are watching on the video. And she is here because she visited us back in January when the book came out. It has now been a huge bestseller. Um, she's been everywhere talking about it. And I know we got a huge response to that episode. In fact, drum roll, please. It is the number two episode ever on Divorce and Beyond. Yay. Second only to Bill Eddy, which is also an episode on narcissists. Um, and so I'm really excited to have you back because we're going today to talk about, and I think this is really important, the biggest mistakes that people make when divorcing a narcissist. And, you know, I really got into this idea and you know this, you and I have talked, Tracy, and for those who haven't listened to the prior episode, which I will link to, Tracy and I have known each other for many, many years. In fact, I represented her in a divorce when I was a practicing attorney way back in time, not from one of her situations with a narcissist. Um, but we have known each other for many, many years. Oh, I don't want to forget. Tracy also has a fantastic YouTube channel. She's been giving me hints on how to up my game on YouTube. And I was recently honored to be on uh, with her and we did a great episode. I really enjoyed it because I thought it was such a helpful conversation about changing lawyers midstream, which happens so often when you are divorcing a narcissist. So first, let me just say, Tracy, thank you for coming back. Oh, I am so excited to be here. You know, I've been looking forward to this. Every time we talk, I went like we talked before this, we could talk all day and it would just keep on going and going. So I'm so excited to be here with your audience and honored that my videos have done well so far. I'm pretty sure it's the narc that's, that's taken the title there, you know, but I'm, I'm grateful that I am here as a resource. Well, I, you know, we do know that the word narcissist is what I call clickbait in the world of divorce, right? Everybody will go click on the, the word, a title that has it, that word in there. Um, because, you know, face it, everybody thinks they're divorcing a narcissist and you and I have talked about this. I do want to say, you know, your book is truly the most comprehensive compendium of tips and insights and case studies. And I mean, in your own wisdom, in your own experiences, that, you know, I highly recommend this. You and I in podcast episodes, on videos, whatever, we can touch on a few topics. We can give some, you know, high level. But if you want to go for a deep dive, folks, get the book. Um, but I did want to, it's the clickbait aspect that I wanted that brought this topic up about mistakes that people make. Um, and so if you don't mind, I'm going to start with one of the things that sort of is one of my you know, bugaboos or something that just really, it's a pet peeve. That's the word I'm looking for. One of my pet peeves is people will always say, here are my top tips for beating your narcissist, or here's how to fight a narcissist. And because your narcissists are so abusive and they're so, you know, they attack, I know that like feels good or sounds good. Like I'm going to fight back, mm -hmm. but my experience at least is that's not actually particularly helpful. So I, starting there, what's the mistake you see there that you see people making when they divorce a narcissist? Um, well, let's add that to my list because yes. we went from my 15 to 14 because I doubled one up before, but that is one of the biggest things to, to follow that. I can beat them. I can do this, right? You know, it's not that we don't want you to win what is fair and just for your situation. It is don't get hooked into almost the revenge aspect of it, because that takes you down a road that, 
you know, you've already lost part of your soul by being with a narcissist. Once you start to do things to get them, if you would, um, it changes the, the playing field very slightly in the actual meaning of what's going to happen, but it changes you inside and it turns things into place where, you know, you don't win, but you've lowered yourself and put yourself in into the gutter to, to win, to fight back, right? If you have a qualified lawyer that's going to do everything legally that's possible, you will get what is just and what is fair, hopefully, right? Um, but don't believe that there's a win factor in, in, in almost like that revenge that, because that doesn't ever lead to anything good. No. And in fact, part of the paradigm of a narcissist, I think is that, that they enjoy the conflict. They enjoy it. It fires them up for you to come at them thinking that you're, you know, you're going to beat them and they're only going to double down when they see aggression uh, coming from your side of, of the, the playing field. I always say the best way to, and for those who can't see me, I'm air quoting the word beat, beat a narcissist is much more subtle. It is not to come at it from this concept of beating them, but it's to come at this concept of understanding what they do and knowing how to manage those behaviors or work around them so that you can negotiate and get the best of what you want out of that, you know, out of that negotiation or paradigm. So that's one of mine. Don't, you know, don't automatically think that what you need to be out there looking for is um, information on how to beat a narcissist. Go with, you know, this is, you know, Tracy's book, Divorcing Your Narcissist. You can't make this shit up. She's absolutely right. You can't. The stuff you'll read in here, people, you're going to read it and go, Oh my God. Yeah, that's my life. But then what you talk about and why the book is so helpful is you give strategies for coping with those behaviors, that shit you can't make up. Right. It's not fighting it. It's coping with it, combating it, but not in a combative way. Right. It's with the plan. If they do this, then we know we're going to do that. Expecting what could happen is what this book is about. Expecting that this particular thing may or may not happen is not to put fear in you it's to prepare you so that you don't have these things happen to you because if they happen like for me my my divorce was just completely blindsided right. you know trial after trial what's happening I don't know I was like swimming underwater if I could have prepared and went oh what they're doing is oh right out of the book of course they're gonna do this of course they're gonna do that but we have a plan if they do that, right? Yeah. So I think that is, again, a valid point. You know, also the double down on on if you go low, they'll go lower. And it's if you've got kids, it's not just about the divorce, folks. If you poke the bear long enough during the trials, it'll make the rest of your post co-parenting life miserable because they will double down. They will use your aggressive tactics to to turn the kids against you you see what your parents doing to me right it, it has repercussions and and that's the most important thing we can say about all of this is if you poke the bear they will get worse and it it has other consequences later and that's for longer it's not just settling the divorce it's what am i going to do for the next 16 years with my kid Right. I mean, it's, you're a hundred percent right. You've got to play for the long game, right? This is not all about what just happened about fighting over your kids, you know, the expense of your kid's baseball uniform or whatever the current battle is. Cause there's always something with a narcissist, but you know, it, it, what you just said about being aware of what they might do or to expect what they're doing. I mean, our, our last episode was called, if you're aware, then you can prepare, right? That's the whole point of the book. Exactly. So that's, yep, book. actually it's right on. That's where I got it folks. I'm, <laughs> I'm not that brilliant. I, I took it right off the back of the, the book, but, um, but it's true. I mean, awareness when it comes to narcissists and narcissistic behavior, and narcissistic abuse, they are pretty predictable once you understand their patterns and behaviors. So that's the key to all of this, not thinking you're going to come up with some strategy to beat them, but that you can come up with a strategy to cope with them or deal with them or manage them, right? Survive, survive them. Or thrive them. <laughs> 
actually yay <laughs> so let's dive in you mentioned you have 14 um biggest mistakes that's a lot of mistakes folks but you should expect that tracy knows all the biggest mistakes that people are gonna make um <laughs> so let's kind of like weed down because like the whole book is a whole bunch of mistakes that could happen and possibilities right so i had to weed down and go all right most common most important and uh, I'm just going to throw one out there, which is uh, don't call them a narcissist. I mean, that's a given that which shouldn't even count as a, as a biggest mistake. But again, as we just discussed, it's going to poke the bear. It's going to enrage them more and set the whole thing on a different trajectory. Yeah. Well, and you're not going to give them insights into themselves, <laughs> doesn't matter how many times you explain it to them, how many links to articles about narcissism you send them. They, they have no ability to see that. And in fact, don't they usually then turn it around on you and call oh. you a narcissist? Always, always. And, and the second card, I have to say, I'm, I'm actually going to make cards, biz cards like this. I have my dumbass card here, but I'm going to make one. That's so their next card is, is, is they're going to, to turn it against you and, and just build up a case that you're bipolar or you're a bad parent. It encourages them to not name call, but false allegations of you. Once you hit them with that, all, all, all bets are off. They can then level up to calling you a bad parent and, and all of the other things, calling child protective services because they were wounded by the fact that you call them a narcissist. That's the danger there. Right. Well, and I think that that's actually another key factor to this is when you make public that you think they are a narcissist, mm -hmm. that goes against, they're, they're concerned with what other people think of them. That's at the core of a narcissist. So you have just violated the biggest you know, or poked the bear in the, in the pokiest kind of way when mm -hmm. you go. And Honestly, it's just, it's never going to have the intended effect Well, you can go and talk to your best friend about the fact that they're always late and it would be great if they tried to be a little more on time, but you are not going to go to a narcissist and say, you know what? You only think of yourself. You did it. You do this. You do that. You're toxic. It's not going to change them. No, no, it's really not. And, and, you know, the lie for them that is their cover their mask is their cover. So by putting that out there, now they've got to react. And that's really what we have to protect yourself from, because as much as it gives you some satisfaction, like I know the truth, <laughs> it, tell your coach, tell your therapist, tell your friends, um, but be very leery of that because you and I have both seen where it backfires oh, yeah. and it's, it's not a pretty backfire. You're already in hell. How much lower do you want to go? So protect yourself by starting with that. Right. And that's actually a good point because once you know you're dealing with a narcissist, the, the gift of that is now, you know, you need to get educated, get the book, do what you need to do to understand what you're dealing with and prepare. So what's another big common mistake that you see people making with their narcissist? Well, ironically, I had a client yesterday. I had spoken to her about two weeks ago and um, she was just thinking and getting started. Hadn't talked to a lawyer really early, early. What do I do? And at seven in the morning, she sent me an email. Oh my God, he took all the money. And, and when we met yesterday, like it was magical thinking that I know him. He would never do those things. And, and I'm saying he only because of this situation. So it happens to men and, and women. Um, but just to, to believe in them that they would not cross this line, they count on that. They rely on that loyalty to who they pretended to be. So that gives them opportunity while you're at work to take all the money because of your naivety on that one. Yeah. And, and that one... Actually, I've seen that happen more times than I can count. And it's not just taking the money. It's all the different sneaky, nasty, underhanded things that they can do, the lies that, that they may tell. Um, they would never stand in front of a judge and lie to the judge's face. Yeah, yeah, they would, you oh, know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
believe the worst and, and worse than that may happen. So yes, no magical thinking. You don't know them. Right. Yeah. Trust your advice. Exactly. And again, if it doesn't happen, hallelujah, but expect it or at least prepare for it. And that way, again, the magical thinking is a danger. Um, believing justice will be served in family courts. Oh, they're going to find out they cheated. They stole money. They lied. They called me names. Justice in a family court is breaking up a marriage, dividing the assets and providing for the children. And, you know, it's, it's not about the truth about their affair or the money they spent on their affair. Justice isn't served in a family court like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, and this is actually true, not just in cases with narcissists, this is true in any divorce case because people behave poorly very often when their marriages are breaking down. Right. And then people will want to go into court to get their pound of flesh, to get justice for the principle of the matter. I always say that that phrase is the most expensive bunch of words in a divorce. It's the principle of the matter, Susan. That's not really what the court system is set up for. You're hundred percent right. The system is set up to dissolve the legal relationship, divide your assets in an equitable or other fashion, depending on your state and provide for parenting of your children in a, mm-hmm. in a nutshell. And so if you think you're going to go into a courtroom and have some aha moment, um, I, I can't remember the the TV show, though it wasn't Columbo, it was the Ironside or something like that, where there'd be the aha moment on the stand. <laughs> doesn't happen in courtrooms very often. No. And then, you know, if, if we think about things like um, contempt of court, Uh, My uh, ex was in contempt of court six out of our seven trials. I kept thinking, where's the justice? Why don't they do anything, right? Not necessarily the family court. Again, you get a judge that really gets, you know, honky on it, then fine. But for a general rule, those sort of things go under. They just want to get the marriage over. They don't want to sit here and litigate every little stupid thing that happens. You won't get justice. Right. And such a good point. You always make such good points, but that is also, you know, contempt of court exists as an enforcement tool. I wouldn't call it the strongest tool out there. In fact, you know, I've, I've been in many courtrooms and asked many times that someone be held in contempt and the hammer really coming down is a very rare occurrence. It's just not as helpful. And I know people, I get these emails. I'm sure you get them all the time. Well, why don't judges, the court system is, is crap. And why don't judges do it? You can rail against that as much as you want. It's an overworked, outdated, overburdened system. That's not built to deal with these types of situations. You're better off to be aware and to be prepared and not be expecting to deal with it in a courtroom, frankly. It's, I'm not saying that's fair or right. I'm saying that's reality. That's reality. And that's what people have to ground themselves in. And that's why we're talking about these. Yep. Because it's so common that we think we're going to get justice and 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 it, it's heartening and it's it's disheartening. We just like one more thing. Wait, you can't do anything about this, you know? And it's like, okay, we'll move on. Let's move to A, B, and C. Justice is is really, in the end, having a good life afterwards, building yourself up and moving on and and hold that as close as you can to your heart, because all the other justice and uh, what ifs and if I had owned these, you know, that cost me one hundred thousand dollars in trying to get the truth exposed. Truth was exposed and nothing happened. And so it it's sort of like. Cut your losses, as we know. I'm not saying walk away with nothing. I'm saying be really leery of that. Right. Make make very considered choices as you move through your process. Excellent. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The next one I have is thinking that if you walk away from stuff, like, okay, you can have the house. Okay, I won't fight for your retirement. Okay, just, just give me the kids and make it easy. You know, you think that walking away is going to make that co-parenting life better. Or even if you don't have kids, you think, okay, they'll go away. We'll, we'll make it nice, nice. It never works because if you start the bar here, it's going to go here, right? And so really important to know that um, if you walk away, it's not over. Um, it doesn't make it easier. I'm not saying 
you can leave things on the table, but don't walk away without the things that are important to you. Right. And, and that sort of goes back to what we were just talking about. I mean, you have to pick your battles, mm -hmm. but there are some things I know of many, many people who hit that point of exhaustion in their divorce from a narcissist where they're just like, fine, I'm just going to throw the towel in. They can keep it all and I'll move forward into my life and everything because this, the divorce is over. It'll all be over. And in fact, with a narcissist, it's actually hard, almost never entirely over. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. true. You actually brought up in the sentence you just said, yep. that pick your battles. My next one was fighting battles that don't need to be fought. A narcissist throws things at you, boom, this, boom, that, boom. And they're just like constant rapid fire of things. And often our, our legal team will just be like sucked into this vortex of defending things that won't matter. Um, and, and that's, again, having a strong team that knows, okay, that's not going to matter in court. They can make all those false allegations. They haven't crossed a line of where we have to defend it for your parenting or for your this. Um, but choosing the battles wisely comes into not fighting the battles that they want you to fight. So taking control of no, that, you know, unless your lawyer says this is what has to be fought, you do need to fight that one, then pick which ones you're going to go with and don't waste money by fighting the battles. The narc wants you to fight. Right. So, so important right there, because you're right. I'm, I'm getting this vision in my mind of wonder woman with her bracelets, like <laughs> knocking away all the bullets. And uh -huh. that's, you need some of those bracelets to be dealing with a narcissist in a divorce because they, they throw everything in the kitchen sink at you. And most of it, is either a hundred percent untrue, um, not factual, or at least has aspects of it. And what drives people crazy, right? Is that, that no, 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 that's not true. And let me prove to you why that's not true. And this isn't true. And this isn't true. But what you're saying is a hundred, so correct. Only deal with it if it has to be dealt with. And it's a very good point to say, Hopefully your attorney has enough understanding of what there is being dealt with and what happens in the courtroom to say, oh, okay, now this is an allegation that goes directly to your fitness as a parent. We're going to deal with that. Mm -hmm. This is calling you a bad housekeeper or, a, you know, whatever. It's just an insult. Let it slide off your back. So okay. yes, picking the wrong battles or fighting every battle, I would say is absolutely that's, a big mistake. That's a double one, right? We could yeah. have find those. Yeah. Um, I have a whole chapter in my book on gaslighting and divorce. And, oh, yeah. um, and it's so good because <laughs> it has so many examples, which I think oh. is so important for people. Absolutely. But believing the gaslighting tactics um, is what cripples people to freeze up on a fight, flight, freeze, right? That's where we're going to be like frozen because they've told you, you'll never see that children. If you divorce me, there's no money. You'll get nothing. Um, no judge is going to give you the kids. You're mental. You're on antidepressants. You'll never get the kids, right? Those gaslighting tactics have worked for your entire marriage. The truth must come out in the divorce where we get those recordings out of your head because if you are stuck on, I'll never get the kids, trust me, it's a lot easier battle for them to win than hell no, you're not taking my kids, right? So it, it it's a frame of mind that the gaslighting puts you into this vulnerable spot. Yeah. Well, and I have to say, because that is so true. And, and so often you've been so beaten down over the course and, and I'm, this may just, I don't mean physically, um, I mean, mentally, the emotional abuse, um, and course of control exercised by a narcissist is just relentless ongoing. And it's a slippery slope downward, right? So very often you don't even realize what they're throwing at you. This is why, it's so important to have a coach, I think, um, to help you deal with whatever we want to call this head trash, um, or just, you know, fit this thinking in your mind. That's really their voice in your head. Mm -hmm. So you really need some help perhaps in dealing with that. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Because again, it's the poison running through your blood that you have heard these lies and it's somebody to come in like a doctor. It's a therapist coach that says, that's not something we have to worry about. And they pull it out. Right. So please know what gaslighting is and know what your rights are because those sort of things that they threaten you, oh, that's not true. Good try is a much healthier way when you're moving through it than, oh no, and having that panic because you do freeze and you're incapable of doing the rest of the things you need to do. That's the goal of this is to, to, to make you just completely not be able to do what you need to do because they've thrown these things at you to scare you and put fear in you. Yeah. I mean, they're master manipulators and they know your buttons. They've been pushing them for a really long time. Really long time. Yeah. So my next one is Trojan horses, right? Falling for the little Greek mythology here. (laughs) (laughs) I just picture Brad Pitt on the the Trojan horse one. Troy, I just picture him inside that big horse. I'm like, that's the one I want. Um, But um, trying to get you to settle before any discovery has happened you know I'll, I'll be fair here this is what we've got in no give me the paperwork and then I'll know what we have let's you know pull this together being really mindful that those tactics are always there to manipulate you further um and you know even even if they're trying to get you to slow down or stop the divorce I'll go to therapy you've always wanted that I'll work on it I'm so sorry right Trojan horse is like Don't fall for that because when you fall for the therapy option here, they are sitting there hiding the money, doing all the other things behind, getting their ducks in a row behind the scenes while you're sitting there going, we're in therapy. I'll see someone next week. You know, meanwhile, you've just given a a, a rope of a week or two weeks or a month for them to do more damage to you behind the scenes because of your trust. So those Trojan horses are, are really dangerous. Yeah, it, it, it makes me think, um, I had a post the other day, um, narcissists are masters of premature negotiation, right? They, they will come to the table before they've ever told you what the marital pie is or given you the information. And they'll say, here's a really generous piece of pie and you should take it because I've already figured it all out and this is the best you're ever going to get. So here's your piece of pie and let's move on. I'm being so fair and such a great guy or great gal, right? Yeah. That and, and that Trojan horse, or we'll go to therapy and lull you into that false sense of confidence. Meanwhile, they are draining bank accounts, hiding assets, moving things around. Absolutely. Yeah, huge. And again, see it every single day yeah. where people fall for it. They again, they want their marriage. They don't want it to end. The victims are like, no, you know, of course, there's some that want to go. But for the most part, they're tapping into that fear of ending the relationship to abuse you further. So be very careful. Um, not planning for the children as they grow. Yeah. Um, big mistake on parenting plans. It's like, oh, the kids are five. So they're in preschool. We'll get preschool into the parenting plan. Eeks. There's going to be a lot more that you have to plan for in the, in the parenting plan. Yeah. Try to make it um, as, as inclusive of your changes in your children's life and growth that you can at least anticipate because you know, your children are going to grow. So try to have that built into your plan. I think people get so exhausted and you must deal with this every day, right? They just to negotiate the preschool parenting plan takes forever. And by the time they're done with it, you know, they're like, you know what, I'm just going to kick the can down the road and we'll deal with elementary school when they get there. Problem Mm -hmm. is now you're right back in the game. And exactly. You're right back in the courtroom because all the negotiations you were doing with your mediator or with your lawyer um, are now without that system. And, and they're going, no, I don't, I don't want them to be in soccer. I don't want them to be like, if those decisions as hard as they are to do them in this process and and a narcissist is going to make them really bad, but as hard as they are, it's worse later because now you're opening up a whole nother case. You've got another giant, like retainer to a lawyer, you're starting another war and that's only for elementary school. Why not get all the way through college one time, you know, do it and get it over with because 
even though it takes more time and money now, trust me, it's twice as much later because you're starting the whole thing over. Right. Right. And I know there actually on your list of biggest mistakes, there's some others that um, are around parenting plans and children, because this is an area with a lot of uh, pitfalls, I would yeah, say. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, so I have another one, which is I have a chapter called the gray areas of a divorce decree. Narcissists see things black and white, but in the middle, it's they get them for Christmas this year. You get them for Christmas next year. And yet it didn't say when Christmas started. It has to be bookended with Christmas starts at this time on Christmas Eve and it ends on here. If it just says you get on Christmas, I get on Christmas next year, they could conceivably have an example in the book, take them for two weeks and go, oh, it was winter break. It doesn't say when Christmas ended. So yep. every single detail has to be very, very specific and granular. Again, now we're fighting back the battle we just talked about but it's now or do it again later, right? It's still going to be a fact that you've got to fight for. And then you're also going to have to negotiate. You're going to have to go, I want this, but they won't do it unless I do that. And then we come to something in the middle, right? Right. Well, and that's actually another mistake that people make, right? They mm -hmm. put their best offer on the table right from the beginning. Absolutely. That's one of them. Absolutely. And again, lawyers will be like, well, this is your best offer. Let's just make it. And um, it, it just, if you're a narcissist, they're like, no, but I want more. So they raise the bar. So if you have some wiggle room, then you can come down to where you really want it to be. So be really mindful to not come out of the gate with your best offer. Yeah. I, re I so remember the very first um, lesson I got from my mentor when I became, when I was a baby lawyer. And he said, as I was going into a negotiation, he said, always start with fat on the bone because they're never going to accept the first offer. So if you go in with your best offer, then you've got nowhere to go from there because you've already put it on the table. So never do it. Even if you say you're doing it, never do it. And certainly don't do it with a narcissist. Absolutely. Yeah. Da dangerous with a narcissist, right? The yes. other part is, is um, details and consequences if they don't do what they're supposed to do. Good one. Uh, and I have uh, an example in the book that a woman client that I went to contempt of court with two years after he was supposed to sell one of their rental properties and give her so much money and he didn't do it. So it had cost her $20,000 two years later to get into that courtroom and the judge she was like, okay, well, he should have given me $300,000, but now I've just spent 20. Can we please have our legal fees? And the judge went, oh God, I wish I could, but it wasn't in the first decree. So if they don't comply with the stuff they've been ordered to, then they'll pay the, whoever isn't complying will then pay the legal fees for someone else would be a really good addition to your, your, your document. Yeah, that's actually a, a pretty, it should have been in the document because I would say that's a pretty standard clause that if either of the parties breaches the terms of this agreement and someone has to enforce it, the court has the authority to award attorney's fees and costs. Now, I will say, going back to what our previous conversation about how judges don't always do and the court system doesn't always mm -hmm. live up to what we would like it to, even when I've seen people have that clause, I've not seen judges award full on attorney's fees and costs for that exactly. type of thing, but something's better than nothing. So have that clause for sure. Absolutely. Again, it's, 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 I'm putting one protective left. It's like I wore one condom, you know, it's like one thing, just try it and see if it works. Like if right. something's out, what are we going to do? Right. But, but this is, this is again, how do we protect ourselves? And that's, yep. uh, that's, big place that it gets into problems. Um, I'm going to go some quick, not having a team, you know, this, you've talked about coaches, what, a, what a difference it makes for someone who is like being led by the hand to go, Oh my God, this is happening. What do we do? Um, having a good therapist, fin having the financial team we've discussed before and, and having your own support system, whether it's a support group, a Facebook group, something that lets you get things out and helps you process or you'll go crazy. Yeah, you, you will. And that it goes back to that. If you're aware, you can prepare. I, when I was mediating divorces and I would have either a high conflict or, you know, someone with a personality disorder, I would not take the case 
if the person who was not the disordered person did not have a coach. If they did not have a coach, they didn't understand the dynamics of what happens in the negotiation and in the mediation. Um, and, and that would drive them out of, they, they, they wouldn't be able to stay in mediation because they didn't understand what was happening. They need, you need, you need the support of someone who knows what they're talking about. Huge difference, huge difference. Huge. Um, last one is staying in mediation too long. Yeah. <laughs> Narcissists, if they are not moving, like on, if you say you're doing the parenting plan first, um, if they are just no way, no way, no way, and you've spent days or hours and you see it's not going anywhere, it's torture. I've had people be in mediation for seven months and not one thing was decided. That should have had cut bait because almost the cut bait of, you know what, fine, we'll go to court would actually make the narcissist react differently than sure, you know, especially if money's no object or you're paying for half of this um, mediation and right. it's got very little skin in the game for them, right? Just be really mindful that you can walk away from that if it's just not moving. So you always have that fallback to litigation or negotiation outside of mediation. I will say, I always want people to be aware of this, that because you, you made a very important distinction in what you just said. You said when no progress is being made exactly. in mediation, when you're mediating or negotiating with a narcissist, there's, you have to expect that progress is going to be baby steps. Mm -hmm. everything moves at a snail's pace when you are moving the needle with a narcissist. So if you are making even tiny progress, that's actually success. Yes, absolutely. And again, it is going to be cheaper than going to court and having someone else make the decision. But for me, my, when we went into mediation, I could see him and his family in their glass room across the hall going, no, no, no. And, and they would, the mediator would come back in they said they're not giving you one red penny burn in hell okay <laughs> how many times do i have to hear that to go this is not working you no know, we went as long as as humanly possible but there was not one thing that they would even talk or open the door on so that yeah. to me was cut bait we didn't have a choice and as you can see the fact that we had seven trials over stupid things like they wanted their day it's almost like they wanted their justice if you think about it, like we started before, it was their justice to bring me to court to make all these things up. All right. But we weren't going to get anywhere in, in mediation. No, but no. And that, that is true. I mean, even Bill Eddy, in, when he came on and he's got the whole book on mediating with high conflict people, narcissists, um, it will take longer than with a non high conflict mediation but only about 70%, he said 60 to 70% of those cases actually will be able to resolve. Some of those cases are just not going to be able to be negotiated or mediated. Um, and there is that fine distinction. So I just want people to, to, it's very easy to overlook small incremental progress. And I don't want people to lose it because that's actually a win if, if we're going to go back to the very beginning, if you want to talk about winning with a narcissist, at least if you are making a little bit of progress, every time you sit down to negotiate with them, you are winning because you will, as you just said, get through it much faster and much less expensively than if you litigate it and have seven trials. I, as you said, I can't imagine what that costs <laughs> in all different ways, emotionally, Absolutely. financially, Absolutely. et cetera. Yeah. So, so yeah, the, the bottom line is um, understand that there are mistakes to be made and understanding what they are and knowing not to do them. They'll learn that in the book. They'll learn all the different things, as, as you've said, thankfully, so many times today. Um, <laughs> but it is getting yourself like more educated on this and, and, and watching YouTube videos like yours and mine and anyone else's that's talking about this. Because A, you don't feel so alone. 
and B, it's not as hopeless. And, and there is hope at the end of all this. And that's what we want people to know as hard as this is going to be, you know, what given birth was terrible too, but I can tell you what was worth it in the end. Right. Um, it's the same thing with the divorce. I'm comparing it, but it is like, we've got to go through that pain to come out the other side and, and have that beautiful new life, just like we would have a beautiful new baby. After. Right. And you did, and you, you did, and you've been through it and you work with people every day who are going through this. You will get to the other side. Um, it, it just, you know, it's common to make mistakes. You're not, no one knows what they're getting into when they get into a relationship with a narcissist. You, nobody knows. And in fact, they're really good at that. That's a whole nother chapter, but, um, they're really good about sucking people in. So don't, be down on yourself if you've made some mistakes, but learn as much as you can. That is the biggest takeaway. I always say to people, the biggest gift of realizing that you're divorcing a narcissist is that it tells you, you have a lot to learn mm -hmm. and it tells you what you have to learn. So absolutely. absolutely. Thank well, you so much. Yeah. Thank you. This is, this is wonderful. The top 15 mistakes people make. Um, so Tracy, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? I will have everything in the show notes, but let's say it here for people. So they can reach me on my website, narcissistabusesupport.com. Um, we've got I just counted the other day. I saw a little thing. And I'm like, oh my God, we have 800 pages on my website of information for people. Um, so you can find out that you can find my book and you can find, I have support groups. I'm actually doing a men's group for the first time, divorcing men's group um, in August. So I'm kind of excited. So if you're watching this a long time ago, <laughs> it's August, 2022, but I am going to try to really bring that together. So all of the information, all my contact, all my social, my Facebook group, Everything's linked off the website. You can find me there. Definitely go there. 800 pages of resources, folks. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. It's all right there. So Tracy, again, thanks so much for joining me. And we'll have to have you back. I'm thinking an episode on gaslighting. What do you think? I love that. Love okay. it. Tracy will be back and we'll, we'll get you ready to not be gaslighted.